Hey everybody, Brian Zane here with another classic paper review review as nominated by my Patreon backers. Well, can you feel it? It's WrestleMania season, so I figured it was only appropriate to look back at some of the classic manias of the past. Let's look at WrestleMania 10 from March 20th, 1994 from Madison Square Garden, the mecca in the heart of New York City. This show was nominated by a lot of people. Michael Whitehouse, Mark E. Blassie, Liam Roberge, Adam Vanderplum, and Kay Hayes, six. Six, six. Uh, they all nominated this show on Patreon.com. Guys, thank you so much. Of course, it's a very pivotal show here in the history of the World Wrestling Federation. It is, of course, the 10th WrestleMania. 10's a very strong number. Anniversaries are fun. In the same building as the first WrestleMania took place, Madison Square Garden, and as the first WrestleMania after Hulk Hogan left the company and tarnished the, the good name of WrestleMania 9 on the way out. Uh, it's a the steroid trial looming ahead in the distance. McMahon has been charged, but the trial has started just yet, but it is in the back of everyone's mind. So lots of scandal, lots of upheaval, lots of change in the WWF as of this time. So would they be able to deliver a quality show? Well, let's just dive right in and see for ourselves. Of course, the big storyline right now in the company is that Bret Hart and Lex Luger are co-winners of that year's Royal Rumble match. They each have a claim toward Yokozuna's world championship. So everyone involved is going to wrestle twice tonight. Lex Luger and Yokozuna will wrestle for the championship at some point in the show. The winner of that match will face Bret Hart for the championship in the main event. And of course, Bret's got his hands tied with another match earlier, which of course we will get to. I love how this show opens with kind of looking back with this sappy, saccharine look back at WrestleMania 1 with clips of like Hulk Hogan and Muhammad Ali. My favorite part of this is though, is that they had Howard Finkel and uh, Gorilla Monsoon at some point go back and post and revoice just kind of generic lines about the show as if it was part of the event. Like you hear Howard Finkel going, Welcome everyone to the first ever WrestleMania, which is not what he said, or at least not in that uh, tone. And then you got Gorilla Monsoon with this canned uh, reaction. Look, it's the greatest Muhammad Ali special enforcer. Like you can just tell from the audio quality. That's not what Gorilla said back in 85. That's not what Howard Finkel sounded like in 85. So just the, hearing them edit that stuff was pretty funny. Then, of course, like it slams you in the face with uh, the WrestleMania theme and, you know, Bret and Yokozuna and Lex Luger, 10 years in the making. It's a big deal here, but the juxtaposition of the old and the new, very nice touch. 18,065 people packed MSG. It's just under a million dollar gate. 420,000 pay-per-view buys, which is down just a smidge from WrestleMania 9. Uh, buy rate of 1.68, which is down from a buy rate of 2 the previous year. Those numbers would get worse each and every year until 1997 finally bottoming out at 237,000 for WrestleMania 13. Then of course Mania 14 happened. The Austin era begins. Mike Tyson's involved, and it just shoots up from there. And before the network came out and kind of rendered buy rates and buy numbers kind of meaningless, Mania never did worse than 560,000 buys for Mania ever again. But this was the beginning of the downturn for the company for sure. Vincent Mann and Jerry Lawler do commentary for this show. Little Richard is singing the national. National anthem. I say he's singing the national anthem. The more he's like he's lip syncing it. It gets really obvious by the end how off he is with the lip syncing. But you know his voice, his pre-recorded voice sounds good, and I actually like the arrangement of this version of America the Beautiful with the gospel singers and everything. I mean, if you don't take into account the fact that Little Richard is badly lip syncing this song, it's actually a very really nice performance. Your opening match is quite possibly the best opener in Mania history as Bret Hart takes on his brother Owen. Lots of bad blood boiling up to the the surface as we build to this matchup beginning around Survivor Series time. Owen and the rest of the Hart brothers were on a Survivor Series team together. Owen was the last one, was the only one in his family eliminated. After the match, he comes back and he's kind of pissed at Brett. He wants to challenge Brett to a match, but Brett absolutely refuses to wrestle his brother. It just goes against everything he stands for. So cooler heads prevail and seemingly things have patched up. Fast forward to the Royal Rumble pay per view. Uh, the Hart brothers, Brett and Owen, challenge the Quebecers for the tag team championships. But when that falls through, Owen Owen famously kicks Brett's leg out from under his leg, his words not mine, and that sets up the whole thing where Owen is tired of living in Brett's shadow. He wants to stand out on his own and he wants to prove to everyone that he is the better wrestler. He says he taught Brett the sharpshooter, he taught Brett everything he knows, he's going to prove it here tonight at WrestleMania. So, like I mentioned, Brett is wrestling Owen here.
here at the Open, and no matter what happens in this matchup, win or lose, he is going to face the winner of the Lex Luger Yokozuna match for the championship later in the night. The match starts off, we get the graps, we get the chains, we get the massive taunting by Owen. Owen is ejected from the ring, he gets back in, and what a slap to the face by Owen. But Brett keeps playing it cool. I do like this part of the match here where it's like clear that Brett still doesn't want to wrestle Owen. He still tries to play everything by the book, but Owen is just right in his face from the get go, taunting him, slapping him, just trying to pull on the hair and everything. So Owen is clearly doing what he can to get under Brett's skin, but Brett does play it cool for the longest time. Owen gets the advantage after a heel kick, more fighting on the outside, in the post, more great action in the ring, high German suplex on Brett. Lawler making constant references on commentary to uh, the matriarch, Helen Hart, and how old she is. I can just see Helen Hart now. She's about two inches from the TV screen. That's the only way she can see. I heard through the grapevine that their mother, Helen's been in the hospital. This match could put her back there. They're having to kickstart Helen Hart's pacemaker right now. We get a jumping tombstone pile driver by Owen. He goes for a top rope splash, but Brett moves. Brett gets all of his moves of doom, and I'm talking about the inverted atomic drop, the Russian leg sweep, the backbreaker, the elbow, you name it, it's there. Owen goes for a sharpshooter. Brett counters it and goes for one of his own. Owen gets out of it. There's a big dive to the outside by Brett, but Brett hurts his knee, and Owen immediately goes after it. He just attacks it with a figure four as well. Brett eventually reverses it. He puts a hurting on Owen for a while. We get a pile driver from Brett. Superplex. Owen kicks out. Owen gets out of a sleeper with a low blow the referee does not see. Owen with a sharpshooter again, and it sure looks like Brett's tapping out before reversing with one of his own. You see his hand hit the mat, and I can see as he's just trying to fire himself up, but sure looks like a tap out to me. But Brett goes for a victory roll. Owen sits on him and pins to win the match. Now, that my whole description of this match cannot do justice how good this match is. I give it four stars out of four. And what a hell of a match. And like I said, probably it's one of the best, if not the best, open opening match in Mania history, one of the best matches, best opening matches in pay-per-view history, and what a story behind it. It's not just some match with no context, hey, let's do some flips and kicks and slap the leg and stuff. This is an opening match with heat. It's an opening match with a story, not only in the build to it, but also the match itself tells an amazing story. This is one of the best matches you will see on this card, and we're not even done yet with that, but yes, easily four stars out of four for me. And by the way, how big a deal is it that Owen Hart beats his brother at WrestleMania? Mania. Like that immediately legitimized him and just made him into this big deal. As they said in commentary, he's not stepped out from Brett's shadow. He has jumped out from behind Brett's shadow. And he's just, he's, I think, I think that if he had lost this match, uh, that would have severely changed his trajectory, not just for 94, but for the rest of his career, I think. But this one immediately makes him a big deal. Ring announcer Bill Dunn introduces Cy Sperling, who is best known for being the president and also a client of the Hair Club for Men. That was a big old ad campaign in the 90s. I'm not only the Hair Club president, but I'm also a client. And his newest client is Howard Finkel, who shows up presenting himself wearing a nice little toupee. Look at that head of hair on the Fink. Up next, some mixed tag team action as Bam Bam Bigelow and his main squeeze, Luna Vachon, take on Doink the Clown and his sidekick, Dink. Oh boy, babyface doink, that never got old. Look, I, I've said before, I didn't really watch a lot of the early 90s stuff. I've gone back later and watched it. And yeah, the difference between heel doink and babyface doink is night and day. It's they, the way they kind of defanged doink and made him less evil and psychotic and you know, more like, ah, happy-go-lucky, fun-loving thing. You know, okay, like it's good for the kids, but it ultimately just, it, it really de it really made the Doink character a lot less cool. Of course, by this point, Matt Bourne was not wrestling as Doink anymore, so even that, even more so, the luster of the original Doink character was kind of diminished. Doink gets some moves on Bigelow early on. Dink tags in, which means Luna has to come in in, in place of Bigelow. So Luna just spends the next few minutes beating the shit out of Dink. She sells for him a little bit, though. He outsmarts her at times. Luna goes for a big splash, and Dink moves. We get a tag. Doink is dumped. Dink challenges Bam Bam, which is a fun visual there. He outruns Bigelow and manages to dodge Luna. Doink with a big old DDT on Bigelow, and it looked just as bad for him taking that bump. Uh, goes for a top rope whoopee cushion, but Bam Bam moves. Bam Bam hits the diving headbutt to win the match. I'm going to give this one two stars out of four. It's a pretty well-executed mixed tag match with, like, there's like, some wrestling, there's a little bit of comedy thrown in, entertaining spots. This is like a pretty pretty good match here. After the match, we get some healing on Dink. Bam Bam and Luna both go for splashes, and Bigelow, like, misses the splash, 
but like Luna hits it as Dink rolls out of the way. It's a really awkward kind of ending there. It just seems like why not have just one person go for the splash instead of both and one of them misses. Look up in the presidential box, it's fake president Bill Clinton sitting alongside the uh, kayfabe president of the company, Jack Tunney. IRS is there and others in the crowd. So wild they did the shtick with the fake Bill Clinton for so long. In what would be his final WrestleMania appearance and his final televised match in the company, Randy Savage takes on Crush in a Falls Count Anywhere match. However, this Falls Count Anywhere match might have some different rules than what you're used to. You see, Norman, I'm used to if you pin somebody outside, the match is over, you've won the match. But no, what they do here is if you pin a guy outside the ring, they have 60 seconds to get back in the ring or they lose. So they can lose twice, essentially. They lose the pinfall, and if they lose by a 60-second countout, then the match is officially over. Seems like an unnecessary additional rule they added to this thing, and I'm glad it has not stuck around. The story here is that Savage and Crush used to be really good friends, but then the fall of the previous year, Crush turned on Randy, because what happened was Crush got crushed by Yokozuna on an episode of Raw, and Randy was such a bad friend, he never checked on Crush to see how he was doing in his recovery. And this, you know, this definitely got physical in the build-up to this. Savage even got suspended as a color commentator for putting his hands on Crush when he was not supposed to be an active competitor competitor. The action starts out on the outside as Savage jumps Crush during his entrance, but he gets beat up uh, for his troubles. We get an early pinfall. Savage has one minute to get back in the ring. He almost gets in, but then Crush's manager, Mr. Fuji, whacks him with the flagpole that, that buys some more time for Crush. Savage just barely makes it back in the ring before the, uh, the count strikes zero. Lawler says, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog business, and right now Savage is wearing milk bone underwear. Huh. Savage is caught in the tree of woe. Fuji hands Crush some salt, but Savage knocks it into Crush his eyes. Savage with a big old comeback, the flying elbow drop, but instead of pinning him in the ring, he rolls Crush out of the ring, pins him there to start the, the, the one minute count. Now, if it's false count anywhere, presumably you can still pin somebody in the ring, right? So why, instead of just taking the easy win and pinning him in the ring, why would you bother to push him out and pin him there and give him the opportunity to get back in the ring. That, to me, makes no sense. Fuji is able to revive Crush with some water, get him back in the ring before the clock strikes zero. Savage dumped on the outside again. They fight on the floor. Over the barricade into the backstage area, Savage is able to pin Crush once again, but this time he ties Crush's legs up and then tries to hang him upside down on this kind of uh, this frame device. I don't know what this is, but he's trying to basically hang him upside down. You can see he pulls him up and then he tries really hard, does Savage to get a knot tied to keep him up there, but as soon as Savage walks away, the knot doesn't hold, it immediately makes Crush a blunt fall right in his head. <laughs> Savage gets back in the ring, Crush is completely incapacitated, and uh, so he, yeah, he beats Mr. Fuji for good measure in the ring, and the clock strikes zero, Savage wins the match. I'm gonna give it two stars out of four, I'm being kind of generous with this one. The match was okay at best. The pacing of the match is weird because of the pinfalls and like the delay before the count begins. That's just a weird rule, I'm glad they got rid of it. Savage, of course, would go into full-time commentary mode after this matchup here, and he would leave the company in December of 94 to go jump jump ship and join WCW. So one thing I love about you know this, this pay-per-view is how between every match, you got all these highlights of Mania's past, all the Manias leading up to WrestleMania 10. And so you see a lot of clips of Hogan and Savage featured pretty prominently uh, in these recap packages. Guess what two wrestlers you don't hear about at WrestleMania 11? Todd Pettengill interviews fake President Clinton and then has an awkward conversation with IRS up there. We get a recap of the Fan Fest that weekend. Randy Savage makes his way to the Paramount Theater, which is adjacent to the main MSG arena and schmoozes with the fans. Then we get our Women's Championship match as Alundra Blaze defends against Leilani Kai. This is Alundra's first WrestleMania here. And uh, Lawler can't stop making rude-ass comments about Blaze's appearance here. There's no wit to it. He's just being totally mean-spirited. Um, the match itself is pretty basic. It's like a weird hybrid because Leilani Kai kind of represents like the old school like, Mula style of wrestling and then you've got uh, Alundra Blaze who has experience in Japan and stuff so she kind of brings like the new style to it. It's kind of like it, she is kind of that next step in the evolution of women's wrestling at this time period. What you see her doing, not a lot of stuff you see women doing in America at that time. Uh, she overpowers Leilani Kai, she makes a comeback, hits her with a bridging German suplex to win the match. 
One star out of four, like I said, pretty basic, not much special about it here. We then get a crowd shot of the fabulous Moolah, Mae Young, and Nikolai Volkov all sitting at ringside. Uh, of course, Mae Young not mentioned by name here. This is long before she would be acknowledged by the company and become a part of the fabric of the World Wrestling Federation. At that point, she was just there sitting next to Moolah as her friend. And of course, the years would go by, we would see her in a much larger capacity as the years went on. We had a backstage segment between Todd Pettengill and the host of USA's Up All Night, Rhonda Shea. Uh, up all night was the USA Network's like B movie vehicle. Basically, to, she was the host, and she would kind of lead you in and out of the segments and stuff. Then uh, Shawn Michaels runs in and, and, and shoes Todd Pettengill away, flirts with Ronda Shear. Then Burt Reynolds comes in and uh, totally steals Shawn's thunder, and now he's hitting on Ronda Shear. They're not the Mounties, but the Quebecers are handsome, brave, and strong, and are defending the tag team championships against men on a mission. Of course, the Quebecers are managed by Johnny Polo, aka Raven, at this time. Men on a mission. Uh, Mabel and Mo. You know, I don't understand why they gave them this appearance because they're supposed to be like a babyface tag team. They're supposed to be hip. They're supposed to be with it, you know, with the young kids and all that stuff. Yet why would you have them dress up like Cadbury eggs? It just, may, that seems kind of counterintuitive. The Quebecers get the early jump on men on a mission. Pierre is launched to the outside onto Mo. What a move for a big guy like him. It's almost like he's not human. Mabel gets the hot tag and has a big comeback. He goes for a corner splash, but he eats the turnbuckle instead. Quebecers go for a double suplex and they're able to pull it off after like two or three tries. They do their big double team like potato sack throw. I don't know what you call that, but it's basically an assisted senton, but I don't think they had a name for it. Uh, Mabel kicks out. Men on a mission have multiple times where they have the match basically won, but Johnny Polo is distracting the referee. Mo clotheslines Pierre out of the ring. A big old splash on the outside and Pierre's counted out. Men on a mission win the match, but not the titles. They kind of look dumb for not getting their opponent back in the ring. They pose the belts anyway and there you go. I give it one and a half stars out of four. It's not an okay match. Nothing amazing. Kind of a weak finish. Uh, these guys would, the men on a mission, I should say, they would win the tag titles just nine days later, allegedly though by accident because the Quebecers didn't kick out in time. And so the belts would return to the Quebecers just two days later. It's time for some guest celebrities. Your guest timekeeper for this match is the previously seen Rhonda Shear from Up All Night. Your guest ring announcer is Donnie Wahlberg from the band NKOTB, not New Kids on the Block. And very important distinction because they never mention the band by its full name, only by its initials, so that was kind of interesting. Your guest referee for this matchup is the returning Mr. Perfect. This is the first WWF Championship match on the night as Yokozuna defends against Lex Luger. This is a continuation of their feud that took up a lot of the summer of 93. This is, you know, all part of the big push to make Lex the next Hulk Hogan ascension, the next big white meat baby face for the company. He went around the country campaigning on the Lex Express and, you know, he body slammed Yokozuna on board the USS Intrepid. There's a lot to talk about this particular era of Lex Luger. I think it deserves its own video and I will talk about that at some point in the future. But right now, all you need to know is like he had this, this few with Yokozuna the previous year. He won by count at SummerSlam. They treated like he won the big one, but he didn't. And so this is his, his next shot at the gold after winning, after co-winning the Royal Rumble match earlier in the year. And now he's challenging Yokozuna here. Yoko is managed by Mr. Fuji and his American spokesperson, James E. Cornette. And oh my God, look at that outfit. That outfit in and of itself is a WrestleMania moment. The match begins with some pushing and shoving. Lex goes for some closed lines, eventually makes Yokozuna fall out of the ring after a few attempts. Some outside fighting. Lex hits a top rope cross body, which totally shocked me. Luger goes for another body slam, but Yoko falls on him. Yokozuna wears down Luger and has a nerve hold on the trapezius muscle for the longest effing time. I didn't time this out, but I felt like it was 10 minutes long. Because every time Luger tried to get back up and try to mount a comeback, Yoko would just take him down, go back to work on the hold. It got pretty ridiculous that uh, I was just kind of starting to fall asleep watching this match, honestly. Uh, Luger powers out of it once again, hits some more clotheslines, does the big body slam, gets Yokozuna up, big running forearm. Cornette gets on the apron and gets beat up for his troubles. Same with Mr. Fuji. Luger goes for the cover, but Mr. Perfect will not make the count. Uh, he is just totally healing on Lex here. Luger shows Mr. Perfect, say, hey, what's going on? And this very long, delayed reaction where Lex, where Perfect's like, hey, you pushed me, I'm the ref. 
<laughs> Ring the bells, disqualification. So yeah, Lex is already healing on, uh, I said Perfect's already healing on Lex by not doing the count, even though it's just right clear as day. And then after this long push, he finally rings the bell and just walks off. So that's the end. I give it one star out of four, and I think I'm being generous with it. This is not a very interesting match. It's lame finish after a boring match with Yokozuna just working a hole for the longest time. Wasn't a fan. Uh, after the match, you see Luger, actually see Mr. Perfect being interviewed, asking what happened, why was he being such a dick to, to Luger. Luger barges in. They have a shouting match. It's broken up by officials and everything. These guys were supposed to have a rivalry after WrestleMania, but some old injuries from Perfect kind of flared back up. His back flared up, and he got apparently a foot or an ankle injury as well. So that uh, feud they were supposed to have never really happened. After a WrestleMania 7 recap of the blindfold match between Jake Roberts and Rick Martel, no thank you, we see Harvey Whippleman in the ring and he's berating Howard Finkel, makes fun of his hair, and calls him monkey-nosed and banana-faced and this and that. It's just, you know, he's very close to getting to purely anti-Semitic here. But Finkel shoves him down. Adam Baum, who is uh, Harvey Whippleman's uh, wrestler, he comes in and he starts to stare down Finkel. Earthquake runs in and makes the save. And I guess we have a match all of a sudden. Uh, the bell rings. And we have the big sit by Earthquake right away. Match is over. Earthquake wins this one. I didn't, and apparently uh, Adam Baum was a last minute replacement for Ludwig Borga. He was supposed to wrestle Earthquake on this night, but he was hurt. And so Adam Baum was a replacement. Why they made this match so short, I have no idea. Maybe a blessing in disguise in hindsight, but I give this zero stars. There's like nothing to this match, you know. I don't know what the point was, but it was kind of cool that on the 10th iteration of WrestleMania, we have kind of an anniversary because, of course, in the first WrestleMania, King Kong Bundy famously squashed SD Jones in eight seconds. This one was 35 second long match apparently. So not quite the record, but it is cool that, you know, at 10 years after the first WrestleMania, we have another big squash kind of match. Of course, Earthquake would be gone from the company very soon. By May, he'd split from the Federation and join WCW, be part of the Three Faces of Fear with The Butcher and Kevin Sullivan, and that would eventually morph into the Dungeon of Doom, Need I Say More. Backstage, Todd Pettengill interviews Jim Cornette, who delivers a hell of a promo, putting over Yokozuna as this real big monster, getting ready for his match against Bret Hart, who of course is still licking his wounds from his match with Owen Hart, not just losing the match and having the mental edge taken away, but also that knee is still pretty tender. In your semi-main event, it's that ladder match. Shawn Michaels and Razor Ramon do battle to see who is the undisputed Intercontinental Champion. This was the first ladder match in WrestleMania history, but the second all-time in company history. The first one happened between Bret and Shawn back in 1992. Anyway, the story with this match is, Shawn was the IC Champion, but he was stripped of the belt for not defending it often enough in kayfabe. In real life, the scuttlebutt is he was stripped of the belt because he just didn't want to put it over. He was refusing to put it over to anybody. So he was stripped of the belt. Razor Ramon wins the championship in a battle royal. But then Sean reemerges with another version of the belt saying he is the real champion, hence putting this match together. And so settling the ladder match. And of course, you know, I'll try and do this match justice. But if you really want to see how good this match is, just watch it on the network. It's right there for you to see. Sean is accompanied to the ring by Diesel earlier. About a minute or two in the match, Diesel decks Razor on the outside. The referee doesn't see it apparently, but he does eject Diesel anyway. So it's a fair one-on-one -on -one here. Uh, Razor with some momentum. He launches Sean out of the ring with a big old clothesline. Razor is officially the first one to bring the ladder into the ring, but he gets a drop kick into his chest. Sean beats up Razor with the ladder a bit, and like Sean just throws it right onto Razor's back. Oh my god, the impact. That looks so painful. Sean goes to the belt, but Razor pantses him. Sean responds with a bare-ass elbow drop off the top of the ladder. Not every day you see that kind of elbow drop happening. Then there's an iconic splash off the ladder onto Razor in the middle of the ring. We get a double down. Sean's back up and sets the ladder up in the corner. Goes to whip Razor into it, but he reverses it. Sean eats shit and falls to the outside. Razor follows him out and bashes Sean with the ladder. Razor climbs up. Sean leaps onto him from behind. The ladder does fall on Sean on the way down. So kind of an inadvertent ladder attack there. They fall off the ladder again together. This time, the ladder actually bends and buckles a little bit. So hopefully it will hold up by the end. Because again, this is back in the, during the era when you didn't have a half dozen ladders outside of the ring. You had one ladder and that was it. I've always wondered what the contingency plan was for something like this. When you have the one ladder and if it breaks, what do you do? Do you just say, uh, match is thrown out or do you have somebody bring
bring in a ladder from the, you know, the backstage area. I've always wondered how that works. Anyway, a pile driver onto Razor, then one of those famous spots in this match where uh, Sean rides the ladder down on top of Ramon. Sean goes to climb again, Razor pushes the ladder down, Sean falls into the ropes and gets tied up by the ankle. Razor climbs the ladder and wins. He is the undisputed Intercontinental Champion and what a hell of a match. Like, much like the Brett Owen matchup, me telling you what happens here is not going to do it justice. You have to see this match for yourself. It's another four-star match. If I had five stars, I'd give it five because it's that good of a match. It really, you know, what can I say about this match that has not already been said into perpetuity by so many other of my colleagues and other fans and experts and stuff? You know, it's the ladder match that set the standard and changed the game for ladder matches for an entire generation, possibly even more. And it's just really one of those matches that made both men. And, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to criticize, I don't mean to knock Scott Hall on this because he does a great job here. But this match is just basically Sean bumping his ass off and there's a ladder there. Uh, every big moment you see in this matchup, Sean is the one who makes it great. Sean is the one who elevates the spot to something truly memorable. And so I think he does, I think Razor does a good job facilitating a lot of this stuff. But the story really here is just Shawn Michaels being a crazy, flippy badass <laughs> in this matchup, bouncing off Razor, bouncing off the ladder. Both men are equally important in the match, but Sean is the one who takes it to the next level. Backstage, Jeff Jarrett, the Head Shrinkers, IRS, and Rick Martel argue over who's going to be the captain for their 10-man tag team match that ends up not happening. <laughs> Turns out the ladder match went way over time, and uh, so the 10-man tag team match had to be cut. 10 wrestlers are deprived the ability to work WrestleMania, and so it goes, oh, that click and their clicky ways. We get a recap of WrestleMania 9 where they show you how Yokozuna cheated to win the title last year. They don't show you what happened right after, though. That leads to our main event. It's the second World Championship match as Yokozuna defends against Bret Hart. Each man has wrestled once before, obviously. Bret a little worse for wear. Uh, here are your guest celebrities for this match. Your guest timekeeper, Jenny Garth. Your guest ring announcer, Burt Reynolds, who is arguably the biggest celebrity here in this very shallow celebrity pool for WrestleMania 10. Your special guest referee for the match is Rowdy Roddy Piper. Yoko gets the jump early on and works Brett over for a while. Piper with some fast counts. When it comes to like ring out stuff and in the ropes, he's just one, two, he's, he's super fast. Like he does not pace himself like most referees do. Like the 10 count alone is something he's going way too fast. Like right at Roddy, booby, you gotta slow down. Brett gets a moment of hope when he avoids a Yokozuna splash. He hits a headbutt, but it seems to hurt Brett more than Yokozuna. Brett's fighting valiantly. Piper goes for a cover. Cornette pulls Piper out of the ring and Piper just smacks him in the face for it. Yokozuna whiffs a headbutt and puts the claw on Brett's face. He runs to the corner, but Brett moves. Brett hits the bulldog. Yoko kicks out at a late two, and again after the second rope elbow. Very close two counts here. Yoko comes back, goes to the bonsai drop, but he loses his balance on the ropes, Falls on his ass. Brett covers him and wins. A big come from behind. Unlikely win by Brett. Very improbable finish. And it's a blast off to the next decade. Well, maybe it's a blast off to the next maybe three years or so. Lex Luger shows up, gives Brett a Laurel and Hardy handshake. The whole locker room empties out to celebrate with Brett. They put him on his shoulders in that famous scene there. Even Vincent Mann gets up from the announce table and celebrates in the ring as well. What a big moment for Brett. And what a complete 180 from how things were at the end of WrestleMania. WrestleMania 9 the previous year, where he got not only gets screwed out of the championship by Mr. Fuji and Yokozuna, Hulk Hogan shows up and steals his thunder and, and basically is the, is the conquering hero for Brett. Oh, go save, save America, Hogan. And now this year, it's totally different. He is the man. He is seen as the conquering hero. He's like the guy now. And that's, they're blasting off the next decade, like they say. And of course, lurking in the shadows on the rampway, Owen Hart, he stares an icy stare at his brother Brett. And right away, we've got our main event scene for the better part of that year because Owen would go on to win King of the Ring a later in the year and then challenge Brett for the championship at that year's SummerSlam in the big blue steel cage. I'm going to give this one two and a half stars out of four. You know, as far as Mania main events go, it's not the greatest. It's not even the best match on this card by any means, but it's still a good match. I, again, I love the storytelling here of Brett already being down a match, already being mentally out of it, being hurt, having to scratch and claw and fight his way back against the man who screwed him out of the championship the previous year, like I mentioned. And uh, ultimately, Yokozuna's size did him in. You know, Yokozuna lives by the size. He wins because of his size, but ultimately here he loses because he was too big. So very poetic justice and very, you know, very, very nice to see Brett come from behind the improbable win to win the championship and really cap off that angle. 
My final grade for WrestleMania 10 is a B minus. I was very close to giving it a C plus grade. I was just back and forth for a long time before I recorded this show. My reasoning for that is this. I think obviously this show is bookended by two of like two of the best WrestleMania matches of all time. You got Shawn and Razor in the ladder match. And before that, you, in the opener, you have Brett and Owen. Those two matches cannot be touched. They are impeccable. To have two of the best Mania matches of all time on one WrestleMania is very, uh, very impressive. And to a lesser extent, the main event as well as a strong match. It is the strongest match on the card that is not the two I just mentioned. Everything else, though, in the middle is just kind of like, eh, it really drags it down for me. Like the women's championship match, not that great. Yokozuna versus Lex Luger for one of the two championship matches, it really stunk. And then uh, the Atom Bomb Earthquake match, it was just kind of like this squiggity squash thing, and it was over and done with. Uh, also, the fact that, you know, it's it, this isn't going to really contribute to the pros and cons, but the fact the 10-man tag team match got cut for time because Sean and Razor went long. It's like one of the catch-22. You know, if Sean and Razor went short, it, wouldn't have been, it might not have been as good a match as it was. Uh, so maybe losing that 10-man tag team match is, is, a, is a sacrifice worth making. But yeah, uh, besides the stuff at the beginning and the end, not that great of a show. So I was really thinking about making it C+. Ultimately, what makes the show better on the whole is when you add the context of it and you realize just how it wasn't quite dire straits yet, but things were on the downswing for the company that time. You know, like I said, Hogan, their proven commodity was gone. Um, you had uh, just the dwindling numbers. Business was not doing so well. You had these kind of unproven commodities in Brett and uh, to a lesser extent, Yoko, Sean, and Diesel, and Lex Luger. They were kind of like bubbling up to the surface. They weren't ready quite yet. Uh, the steroid trial, like I said, looming in the distance still because there's the controversy of that. So when you really get down to it and you look at how the business was at the time, the fact they were able still to have what was, you know, a very uh, overachieving WrestleMania, I think really put that out for me. So when you add the context of where the company was at the time, that to me is what elevates it from a C plus to a B minus. Not just the great matches they had, but the great matches they had in spite of everything going on in the company at that time. Well, I hope you enjoyed my review of WrestleMania 10. If you want to play a role in determining which classic shows I review in the future, be they good, bad, or somewhere in between, go to patreon.com slash wrestlingwithregret, become a $10 backer or above, and you'll have the chance to nominate classic shows for me to review in the future. Next time on the classic segment, we're still rolling ahead through WrestleManias of the past, and we're jumping 10 years ahead to where it all begins again. I'm talking about WrestleMania 20 from MSG. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.